Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Win with Heather Havenwood. And I am so excited that you are here today. Today, we talk about winning in entrepreneurship, winning in life, winning health and life and relationships and everything in between here on The Win. But I have someone really amazing on the line today, someone that I actually interviewed for my very first show, The Sexy Boss Podcast, in like 2012. And um, I just love the fact that she's coming back on. It's, we're going ch- to we're gonna chit chat and talk about what's going on in her life now. But she is truly an amazing woman um, to me because she was one of the first ones I interviewed so long ago. So I want to introduce you to Sayeda Desley. How are you? I am so happy to be here. It's like, I love it. I love how successful you've like blossomed and in, in all that you've done. And it's just really nice to actually come back around and, and reconnect and see your beauty and your radiance again. Oh, thank you so much. That I, I'm blushing. If I can't see, I'm blushing. Um, yeah. So what y'all need to know is I have a show called the sexy boss podcast. It was, I started in 2012 or 13. I did uh, some amazing interviews, like four or five women, you included. And then I just put it up online all at once. And then I was like, nothing's happening. And so that was, that was kind of the end of it. But at the same time, it's still out there and they type your name in and it's still there. So and it was a beautiful interview there. So it's evergreens forever. So I want to tell you who Sayeda Desole is. She wants to live in a world fulfilled with audacious, sexually sovereign women living life on their own terms. As the thought leader and body philosopher, she has published several books, The Emergence of the Sensual Woman and The Illustrasis. Ooh. Jade Egg, I'm not sure what that one is, and had her innovative method featured in Dr. Christine Northrup's best-selling books, Woman's Wisdom, Woman's Bodies, and The Secret Pleasure of Menopause, as well as in Dr. Rachel Abrams' book, Multi-Orgasmic Women and Body Wise. Look, after two decades of dedicated and body professional practice, Sayeda, visionary spokesperson for sexual sovereignty, a violent rape that nearly cost Sayeda her life that put her on this path. And now the quest is how to usher in a new path that brings men and women into right relationship with the other, with each other where sexual sovereignty is the cornerstone for both the sexes and is the foundation for building understanding, respect, compassion, and strength. A world where physical or psychological oppression is no more and the Me Too movement is no longer necessary. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's so amazing to be here. And I, I have a sense this is going to be a very delicious conversation. Yes, it will. This is, I mean, you know, we first talked so many years ago at the same time I've grown as a person, as an entrepreneur, and I have completely grown more into my feminine own power. And, um, it is something that I have, uh, I, I'm reading the book by Regina, Mama Gina. I can't know if I can say the name online. It's the called Pussy. Name. I'm going to yeah. <laughs> so the name of the book. It's called Pussy and you're welcome to go check it out. She's the, uh, mama of the woman of, of, I don't even know, the woman of, Womanly Art. arts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, but I really want to talk about your specific work about sexual sovereignty and the feminine power. And before we tap into that, you were talking earlier in the green room about a specific project that you're really helping women kind of come out of their comfort zone. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's called the daring project. And I put it together seeing that there was a need for women to have a safe place, not only to recognize that their voice is essential, but that their stories are important, that we're not our stories, but our stories are very important and need to be shared. And, and then also to introduce some, I call them like little daring videos every week where I want women to explore different ideas in their own lives to live life on their own terms, really. So I'm confronting mm social mandates, I'm confronting habits, I'm confronting assumptions so that we can be more free and expressed and confident and vibrant and really bring our genius into the world. So it's an amazing project. It's global. So it literally is cross-cultural, cross-age, cross-everything other than the fact that it's only for women. So daring, I have to share my story of daring. And it's something I just started this last week because it's uh, something that scares me. And it's, um, yeah, it's taking a stand-up comedy class. And I know people are like thinking, when I first, actually my first day, I've only been one day. And when I was there, say so they all were look, looking at me going, How, why are you here? You know, you're in radio and TV and all this stuff. And I said, because I'm not funny. <laughs> 
<laughs> they all laughed. I started laughing and I go, no, it's not funny. I'm not funny. Like, you know, I don't, that's why I'm here. And they all were cracking up and I'm like, I'm not trying to make a joke. It's true. Like I'm not funny. Uh, so they're like, great, we're going to change that, but you should go with that, that you're not funny. Cause that's funny. And I'm like, I, yeah. okay. So anyway, that's the point. The point is it scares me. It dares me. It dares me to do something that I don't feel comfortable in. So can you share something you've done or one of the people and going through this process that they're doing? Yes. Something I, uh, is very daring for me. I just recently wrote another book. It's not out yet. It's coming out in September. It's called Desire. And what's daring about this little book, it's a pocketbook, um, is that I actually reveal uber personal stories intentionally. I want to bridge. I want to create connection. I want to take desire into the real world instead of it being, you know, something worth assuming it's about and make it real and show the messiness of our, our human lives and the beauty of that is phenomenally daring because yeah, it's, it's just to reveal that much personal deep experience feels very edgy for me. And yet it feels like it's in complete service because I want that authentic connection with the reader. Desire. Wow. That's hot. Super sexy boss hot. And desire I think is something that I remember that movie with Mel Gibson this is years ago and where he started to actually hear what women thought do you remember this movie yes yes right and so he was like in Central Park and women are just you know jogging by and he was actually hearing what they were thinking and he was just like freaking out I think that's what desire is like if if people actually heard what we desired if they if we actually put voice to what we desired as women I think you would freak people out and your stories, whatever you're, they're sharing your intimate stories. We all have stories. And it, when you share your vulnerability, it gives us the, the opportunity and the permission to share as well. And that's the power of that. Yeah. And I, and Heather, I really believe in cultivating daring because right now I feel like apathy is the one thing that's actually hurting the planet to be apathetic and, and daring is innate to us. It's natural to us. We, we have it. I mean, you think about our ancestors living around lions and stuff. You had to be daring to survive. And now you need to be daring in order to be innovative and creative and come up, you know, with different ways of supporting your communities, etc. So daring is a really strong part of the desire book because I feel that we just need to practice it more. We need to flex that muscle more. And, and that's what the daring project does as well as it gives you that the workout for your daring muscles. And if someone's listening, they're like, wow, I want to be a part of that. Where can they go? TheDaringProject.com. Right. Oh, the great script. TheDaringProject.com. I'll go check that out. It's international. I love to do it. Maybe I'll throw my hat in as well because I'm going to be doing a five-minute stand-up comedy show. That's part of the course, like at the end of it. Um, that's why I asked you in the green room, hey, I want to interview comedians because I'm not funny. So I figure maybe if I interview some people that are funny, it'll like rub off. Right. So, you know, there we go. That's my own daring thing that I'm dealing with as a woman, right. To be laughed at or laughing. Anyway, that's my thing. So let's talk about more about what your practice is and being a thought leader and this word body philosopher. How are you helping women emerge, right? Emerge with sexual sovereignty into the world and into business. I think a lot of times I'm going to put in what I think. I think a lot of times what I hear from women is like, there's this sexual thing and there's this relationship thing. And then there's like really like 10 miles apart, way in the distance there's business. So if I'm in business, I don't bring in my sexuality. If I'm in my sexuality, I don't bring in business. I don't like that. That's why I brought Sexy Boss in. But tell me what your philosophy is and how do you help people bridge that? Yeah, I love this question and I love what you shared actually, how, how you see that and that you're not an advocate for this uh, separation. And uh, so two things. First, I'm going to describe what sexual sovereignty is so we're not confused. And then I'm going to jump in to answer the question. So sexual sovereignty, sovereignty being your, it's you are the sole authority of your body, your pleasure, your fertility, whatever you choose to do with your body, your sexuality, it's for you to choose and you alone, and it should not be depicted by anyone external, whether it's a family member, an institution, or a government. So that's where sovereignty is. I believe that we're all born that way, that we're born sovereign beings. This body is the only thing we have, and it's with us our whole lives, and then 
when we die, that's it. But there's nothing else that we really have full ownership of. So to claim this space is really important. In sexual, I added the word because we tend to leave it out. It's a very important part of being a human being. It's completely natural. It's like breathing. And I'm in a process of wanting to educate people like, hey, sexuality is natural and there's much more to it than the act of sex. Mm, okay. So let's talk about that. If it's, cause I agree with you when you add the words sex, sexuality, sexy, sexy boss, people have this construct and this view. I can only speak from my experience with, when I first came out with sexy boss, even the sexy boss podcast, I got all this pushback. Don't put sex, sexuality, sensuality into business and business, not into sexuality. It's like church and state, you know what I mean? You got to keep it separate. So how do you, and I, I disagree with that to be honest. I, that's why I put two words together. That's why you're putting sexuality and sovereignty together in the, this body philosophy. Can you give us like some examples on how you're helping, let's just say women for a second, women really be able to merge that and yeah. bring that to their lives. And what are the results? Well, for both men and women, unless there is a listener that has achieved this, because I'm really curious, but as far as I'm aware, we cannot leave our genitals on the bedside table when we go into the world. <laughs> And they're, <laughs> they're with us in our meetings. They're with us when we're asking for bank loans. They're with us with our in-laws. So, true. You know, so sexuality is inherent and it's not something that is separate. The act of sex is separate. It, does, it happens in, in when we choose to have it happen, hopefully, in the choice factor. Uh, but your sexuality is with you always. Your sexual energy is with you always. So I like to change this word instead of using the words sexuality and sex and all this stuff, because there's so much charge, I use the word aliveness. It's our spark plug. It's what keeps us sparkly and alive. And then I like to say that actually a body that runs pleasure, and it's been proven by a lot of different science. So it's very cool. You can have a look at it. Telomere science, mm -hmm. uh, very important. Like it's actually, you can reverse aging by running more pleasure and relaxation in the body. They've proven that now. Um, there's the science of um, what's the substance. There's a really cool substance. It'll come to mind. Running pleasure actually allows all the systems of the body to function optimally. So this is really important and something that I bring to women and men, but especially my focus is with women into business, that if we're trying to create a successful business, there will be moments where we have to focus really hard and we don't sleep and we get stressed out. That's true. But if the majority of the time we actually can be integrated and allow ourselves to feel the pleasure, the delight, the enthusiasm of showing up in our gifts and bringing those gifts into the world, already we're a step ahead of most people because innovative ideas won't come to a system that is shut down and stressed out. Biologically, humans can't get creative when they're in a state of uber stress. It's just, you're running from the tiger or you're like relaxing by the brook and you're getting creative. Like in the biological system, we haven't evolved really from that. So it's still affecting us. So it's something, if we can harness that understanding, we'll be so much more effective and so much more creative and innovative. And innovation is needed, right, right now. So imagine that, that you have this resource not only to have more vitality, you boost your immune system, and what I have found, Heather, and this is a little edgy maybe for your podcast, but it's, I think it's important to mention, the it's pelvic fun. nerve. Okay, I want to talk about pelvic nerve is my favorite thing. Can I do that? Yeah, go for it. Say, the, <laughs> say it again. The pelvic nerve. It's the pelvic nerve, okay. Not a very sexy name, but the pelvic nerve. It's basically a, a nerve found deeper in the pelvis of men and women. I'm going to speak specifically on research that was done on women. Okay. It was found that when women could attain um, relaxation and arousal at the same time, so I call it relaxed arousal, or, or in the language we're using now, like just being relaxed and feeling switched on, inspired, enthused, that state, but you're relaxed, you're not like, eep. you're open, you're relaxed. That state they found by doing MRI scans and vaginal, um, uh, they had a probe just to scan what was happening vaginally to the pelvic floor. Yeah. They found that when women were induced in relaxed states of arousal, mm -hmm. confidence, self-esteem, and creativity centers would light up very strongly in the brain. 
So there is a direct connection between our higher functioning. Who doesn't want to be more confident, have more self-esteem and more creativity? Yeah. Right? To the signals received from the pelvic nerve and the rare particular signals, relaxed arousal signals. So this is really intriguing to me. My entire body of work has been around helping women um, bring themselves into that state. And I'm not talking necessarily only through masturbation. There's, there's other like breathing exercises and movement exercises that also help women have this as a practice. So imagine if that is true, which they've now proven with these scans, you're at work. Yeah. It's a stressful day, but you take a really deep breath and you're like, you know what? Hmm. I get that I'm going to access way more resources if I let myself do the best I can today from a place of joy and gratitude, mm-hmm. even that simple, you're now telling the body, relax. And then you understand your pelvic floor enough that you actually know how to engage the pelvic floor in such a way where you light yourself up. It's not like a huge turn on physical. You're not going to go crazy and have orgasms ever, although you might, but most of us, it's just a light feeling of being switched on mm-hmm. with that relaxation. And then you enter your whatever you're doing, it's so much more effective. Yeah. It's so much more effective. And I've heard the statement that sex transmutation, which let me me repeat it. Sexual energy, let's call it that. Sexual energy is actually creative energy. Do you align with that as well? Yes. Yes. So that's both a, um, you know, modern idea, but it's also been around for thousands of years. If you study Taoism and like Chinese medicine, they value sexual energy. Like it's the fountain of youth. It is the fountain of youth. And I remember, I can only speak from my experience and I want to talk to talk about what you're saying. I remember when I came out with sexy boss and people were saying how much I need to separate those and how sexy doesn't work in business and business and work in sex or whatever. And I think it's speaking to exactly what you're saying, even with you're talking about the, uh, pelvic nerve. It's like, it's all connected. When we walk into a business meeting, when we're walking into helping our kids with our schoolwork, whatever, we're all connected at this time. When we're with our relationship, when we're not, when we're single, like I'm single right now. And I know for myself, whenever I think of sex and I'm changing that paradigm, at least I did in the past is like, that means, Oh, I only can have that when I'm in a relationship. That's not true. It doesn't even mean that you have to be seeing someone to be what you're talking about, sexually sovereign and tapping into this, this creative energy. Am I right on that? Absolutely. Okay. So there is a point, like what we've done, the, the, the sad part of social conditioning, which happened at a very young age for all of us, is there is a disassociation with our body and a lack of trust around um, this power that we have, this magnetic power, Mm -hmm. this power that helps us feel switched on and lit up. But honestly, there's really just an on-off switch. All biological beings, even down to amoebas, respond to this. So we are either opening up towards what feels good or we're contracting away from pain. That's, That's the foundation of biology. Right. So how do, can you, okay, this is great. This is like some good stuff. People turn on your, like, turn this up. This is really good. All right. Um, so this is beautifully spoken about how you're saying this. You're either, you know, opening or contracting, which is everything in life. Either you're open to that or you're pulling back or you're moving towards, or you're contracting. I mean, that's just in business, that's life is personal. All right. So let's talk about that one piece. How do you open it up? I'll speak for myself. I know that after I'm, I'm single right now. Um, I, I was in an engagement and it took me a while to kind of move through what I need to move through to be able to open up, you know, to be fearful of being hurt again, all those things. So I think opening up though is something you're saying something else here. You're talking about more opening up the creative juices in the, in the sexual sovereignty juices with all of us, the central part of us as women. Can you kind of talk about that, like how to do that in, in such a way in a daily yeah, basis? Yeah. So let's talk, let's take it the conversation to sensuality so sensuality. that, that okay. you can understand the role of sensuality in all of this. And you'll see how it impacts uh, at business and in meetings and just in life in general. Yeah. Yummy. So if you're a healthy human being and you have access to your senses, you are a sensual being. That's just how it is. So the senses, all these senses, help us make sense of reality, right? Yeah. So sensuality 
is how we make sense of reality. It's literally that. Now, what happens in a society, in a world that's so intense and there's all this craziness and violence and intense stress, what happens is we tend to shut down our senses just to deal with it. Yeah. So there's a numbing out. But what that does, because our survival in the past, imagine, you know, again, savannah, lion, that kind of thing, was essentially connected to how profound our senses were attuned to the environment. Mm -hmm. So it was a very sensual experience of life. It had to be. You had to be aware what was going on. So when we numb out our sensuality, we actually shut ourselves out from a connection to life and B to even keeping ourselves safe because now we're not able to receive the signals that are happening way before issues and problems happen. So sensuality isn't just uh, it's been hijacked by, you know, sexuality in the porn industry, but sensuality is inherent to living well. Sensuality is inherent to um, feeling really good. So, for example, at work, one of the things you can do to inspire yourself to feel more alive, to feel more connected, is have some kind of beauty, whether it's a bouquet of flowers or a beautiful image or maybe uh, on your breaks you listen to some really beautiful sounds, nature sounds, or something that's feeding your hunger for beauty. All human beings in their essence are starved for beauty, especially right now. So if you can give yourself that, that's the first step. Just like have one flower, have a potted flower. I don't care what you have, but have a way right. to not only have a two-dimensional screen and the half dues, which is only a small portion of what creates success. We want to be able to tap into sensuality to start feeling good because, like I said, innovative thought, creative, true genius does not come from repeating and duplicating what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. So if we're just taking in feedback from everyone externally all the time, right. we're not self-sourcing our amazing genius. And I actually believe that the more connected we are with our bodies, our sensuality, and yes, our pleasure the more our genius then has uh, kind of like a greater access mm -hmm. to our life. Like it'll come out in more avenues. It'll come out in really interesting ways. And that's what the new book is about. And one of the deep desires, it's not just for sex. We all have a desire to contribute, to leave a legacy. And that is a profound and very moving desire. It is a profound moving desire. And uh, the book I was referencing on sex transmutation was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It's been around for many, many decades. And I reread that chapter this week and I forgot that I was interviewing you. It's like, perfect. So I was re, I was just now like realizing the connection, right? So I reread the chapter, chapter 12, Sex Transmutation. Most people don't even read that chapter. And one of the things it says, it was like I was reading it for the first time newly. And a lot of it's very male driven because that was the time which he was writing. But I felt like it was speaking to everyone about what you're talking about right now. And that is when you can tap into your sensuality, you can tap into the fact that we all have a desire for things and desire for connection and desire, he called it love, romance and sex, like this combination. And then when we have that desire and we can actually bring it into our lives, which is pleasure, which is you're talking about, and then we can actually pull that into our business and life. That's when we, we call it. Success, he calls it success, right? So I think it's a beautiful piece that you're bringing this all together for women to really be able to tap into. And it really has nothing to do with, let's just call it um, the physical side of just sex. It's not just the, the physical part of sex. There's a sensuality, a sexuality. I want to ask you a question because a lot of your books um, and the ones you've been part of are about the body right? And sensuality. So if someone's listening going, well, I don't feel sexy or I don't feel I, we don't have, I'm maybe in a relationship, we don't have a lot of intimacy. How can I start? How can I start mm. to tap into my own intimacy and, and sensuality and sexuality with my body? How do I, most women, my experience, I'll say this, is they're shut down there. Like there's this whole like wall when, you know, just, you know, shut down. So if that, if they want to just start to break through that, how do they do that? 
Oh, I love this question. Thank you so much for having the daring <laughs> to ask it. It is. I'm nervous. I'm over here concerned. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it is daring. It's daring to have this dialogue, but, but we're adults and yeah. in the world. And like I said, unless you found a trick to leave your genitals on the bedside table, sexuality is inherent. It's part of our living life. So is sensuality. So the first place to start is with the sensuality. Don't worry to jump straight to the sex parts. Even with a lot of women who are quite shut down or have a lot of trauma, one of the sayings I, I give them is, first of all, you need to know you're not broken. So we're not going to fix you. That's very important to establish. So anyone who's listening to this, if you've ever felt like you're broken somehow, especially around sexuality, you're not. So trying to fix that, that's why it's not working because you're not broken. So what we're going to do instead is establish that and invite you to discover what is the slowest part of you right now? What's kind of keeping you from doing anything? Where's that? And sometimes it's actually our heart has nothing to do with our genitals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's something missing in our lives that creates that enthusiasm. That's the slowest part. Or maybe like you said, you had heartbreak and you're really tender in your heart. Yeah. That could be the slowest part. So we want to start. So I always say, I got this from um, Cheryl Richardson, who used to coach Oprah, I think. And she said, uh, we should only move as fast as the slowest part of us. And ever since that day, I heard that. I have, I'm like, that's my life's work. So, uh, so that's what I would encourage. First, discover what would be that slowest part. What's holding you back? Mm -hmm. And give that part of you some acknowledgement. So for Heather, with the heartbreak and the tenderness, just to have some time to go, wow, that is a very vulnerable, tender place. And guess what? I'm going to stand totally in my sovereignty around this mm -hmm. and hold that as um, precious and important. And I'm going to let that lead. What does my heart need? So that's a hard conversation. But what we're doing is we're building intimacy, practicing intimacy with ourselves. Yeah. And what I have found, Heather, in, in coaching so many people, even relationship experts, that if there is no willingness to be intimate here, then it's very hard to have a solid, lasting intimacy with other. Yeah, that's true. And so what I'm hearing is like, it's like when we can have pleasure, that's only then can we actually accept it or have it or own it or give it, you know, one of those, yeah. when we start to give us ourselves pleasure or give ourselves self-love then at that point, can we only receive it from others and give it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So one of the first places I often start women, because I do have a course um, yeah. where uh, it's called the Jade Egg Mastery, but it's a course that takes women through step-by-step step how to rebuild this intimacy, how to have connection, how to create your own sexual health as well, so that it's for a whole life, that it doesn't end at some point. And if you're really, really stressed, often sexual health issues will come up whether it's hormonal or fertility or even for women who are going, say, perimenopause or postmenopause. These are serious things that affect women in their ability to show up in their business, to be honest. Yeah. So we want to take charge of that. We want to have full ownership and claim that part of our lives without shame, just with like, yeah, it's natural. I brush my teeth, I wash my body, and I take care of my sexual health. <clears throat> so there, that's one place to start is to identify what the slowest part is and to, you know, have allegiance with it. Like just say, I, 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 I am here. I'm I am here. here. I'm connected. Yeah, I'm here. I'm connected to my higher self. So let me ask you a question on that. Um, let's see. What exactly when you are working with a client, do you have like some affirmations or things like that, that you help people, um, you know, do or say, I mean, do you have any affirmations? Actually, I don't, I don't use affirmations and okay. here's why, because affirmations are really for me of the mind. And, um, so all of my, my degree and my work is based on psychosexuality, which means the mind and the body are connected. So what is more important for me is, is definition. This will really help the listeners. Okay. So, because if I were to tell you something, I don't know you. It could like totally be worthless, but what you define is so important, right? So, uh, so basically, uh, one of the things that I think is important is people believe that they need to be disciplined in order to cultivate these things. 
right? Or to run a good business or whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. I completely disagree. I think when we go for discipline, we're going for full rebellion against ourselves. <laughs> but there is something that can support us to have tenacity, especially to the difficult moments. And that's dedication. And that comes from your heart. So what I want to invite the listeners is instead of an affirmation, what are you deeply dedicated to? Mm. What is it that you would love to see fully emerge and be expressed in your life? And are you willing before, say, your exercise or your meals or a meeting or anything you're actually going to engage with, self-care, to bring back that dedication to the forefront and say, I am dedicating this meeting, this meal, this exercise, whatever it is, to whatever it is that you're dedicated I'm to. I'm dedicating this yoga class to health and well-being or love or romance or sensuality or yes, money, right? Okay. So whatever is important to you, it has to matter. It has to matter here, not as a con concept here because it matters to everyone else, mm -hmm. but it has to really matter to your heart. Mm -hmm. And that's where the daring comes in. Like, oh my God, can I even say that to myself? Yes. And we should, we should be daring and say those things. Oh my gosh. Just so much riches rich sneers. We could go here forever, but I, when I would wrap it up here in just a second, I'm going to wrap it up. So tell us where can people find you? If they're just intrigued and seduced as they all should be to you and who you are in the world, where can they connect with you? Yes. There's a few places. So for men and women, the general place to come and find me is dare your desire, dare your desire .com. And for women who want to flex those daring muscles more and really like find their voice, gain more confidence, create community. I mean, let's not be isolated anymore, right? That's the daring project.com. Mm. So I think those two places are a great place to start. And I'm also on LinkedIn so that I have actually a really great program linked in. I'm starting to support professional, professional women on how to have, if you're a leader in the industry, your industry, and you work with women, you, you're going to need some skills to handle the me too stories that are going to start popping up because your clients trust you. And that's, you're probably going to be the first responder. And so I've created um, some free resources to really support business owners and leaders to uh, hold those conversations in a very impeccable way. Wow, that's really important right now. I, I agree with you. There is a lot of Me Too stories coming out and you have to kind of be delicate with each one because they're each unique and they're not all the same. Um, and uh, yeah, you have to be really delicate with that as a leader and as a thought leader. I know that right now there's a specific video going around of Mr. Tony Robbins that doesn't look so well in the world of the Me Too movement. And I think that one of the reasons why there's some outrage a little bit, a bit about it is because he's such a thought leader and he could really make an impact there. And instead the and you, if you listen to yourself, you have your, everyone has their own view. I kind of have a different view from the comments, but you know, um, it didn't look so well, right? So I think that is really important as a thought leader to be really conscious of the movements that are happening. Make sure that, um, just make sure you're dealing with them correctly because people can really, you know, it's a personal thing. It's really a personal thing, especially with Me Too movements. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Heather, I'd love to also give that resource, but it's just me yeah. on LinkedIn. So Dr. Sayeda Disley on LinkedIn. And there, uh, there's a group that I formed specifically for female oh, leaders. Yeah. What's the group name, please? Um, gosh, I can't even remember this okay, right no, this second because I fine. just formed it last week. But what I'll do is I'll send you the link. You'll have it. You should probably listen to it yourself. You're such an incredible leader. It's very simple things, things that you don't have to be a psychologist or have all these degrees, just very human, simple things that you can implement immediately as a leader, as a thought leader, as a person who's you know in contact with women. Because I have found that as a business leader, your clients they're going to trust you before they trust anyone else if you did it right. And often they're going to tell you things that you're like, God, I'm not skilled to listen right. to. Yeah, to right. it. yeah, my life. I'm like, whoa, I'm not skilled for that one. Yeah. Right. So I want to give you at least some, some ground level skills that are uh, across the board safe to use and really, really fantastic in support of women really going on that reclamation journey. That's what this is all about is getting women to embrace the reclamation and um, to take that on. So, so I'm going to tell you that everyone again, please go check out dareyourdesire.com. And I want you to go check her out on LinkedIn. I'm going to spell her name for you. S-A-I-D-A. -A. It's the first name. 
Saida. And the last name is D E S I L E T S. Okay. It's going to be the only one there. So don't worry about it. There won't be many and go check her out on LinkedIn. Go check out this amazing group. If not, just go to dareyourdesire.com, sign up one of her newsletters and let's just, you know, start the conversation with yourself. And every, if you're a man listening to this, you're thinking, whoa, this is over my head or whatever you're thinking. Look, you have a mom, you probably have a wife or an ex-wife or a sister or an aunt. I mean, women are around you. Okay. So men who are just like closing their ears going la, 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 la. You, you know, like we are part of your life and we want you to understand how we think and feel and what we're going through as well. So I just wanted to point that out. So go check that dareyourdesire.com. So Saida, any last words? Yeah, I just want to thank you, Heather, for your grace, your beauty, and your deep intelligence. And I'm just really honored to have been here. And thank you to the listeners for being daring and for leaning in and for just even considering whether you're a man or a woman, that, that your body is a place worthy for you to fully embody. Mm, oh, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here, everyone. This is Heather Havenwood with The Win, and I'm interviewing Dr. Saeda Delis. I can never say your last name right. Um, say your last name for me. Desile. Desile. Dr. Sierra Desila. And my name is Heather Havenwood. Check us out on heatherhavenwood.com. Everyone, this is Heather Havenwood. Have a great day. Bye.